1962's The Wonderful World of the Brother Grimm. Where did all this start? Well, with the first Cinerama film, of course. This is Cinerama, opening here at the Broadway Theater at 1681 Broadway on 53rd, at, on September 30th, 1952. It immediately became a huge sensation, and why? Cinerama used three adjacent 27 millimeter wide angle lenses to capture a, a more than three times as wide picture with an immensely wide depth of field. It was all in focus. It used a six perforation tall film frame, not just four, to capture a taller picture. It was projected at 26 frames per second, not just 24, to capture a smoother image. And it had seven channels of discrete stereo sound, not just a mono track, to surround you in sound that came from its source on the screen, whether to the left, right, front, or back. And it projected on a deeply curved 146 degree screen to add to an immersive experience, the first of its kind. Audiences loved Cinerama and couldn't get enough of that first feature film or the next four. Shows for the first were initially sold out for days, then weeks, then a year, two years, three years, nine years continuously in one theater or another, someplace, it eventually made back 32 times its production cost. This is Cinerama started a motion picture revolution. It was not only the inaugural feature for a dynamic new cinematic process, it prompted 20th Century Fox's acquisition and branding of Henri Chrétien's uh, hypergonar lens, which he had called anamorphoscope, and which he'd originally shown them in 1928 when they weren't interested. Uh, Warner Brother, Fox now beat a similar urgent Warner Brothers offer to Chrétien by just one day, and with their acquisition, which they rechristened Cinemascope, the widescreen race was on. In just less than a year after the This is Cinerama premiere, literally 50 weeks later, Fox's The Road was premiering in Cinemascope in the U.S., and it became a box office success, making back just seven times its production cost. <laughs> and other widescreen cinematic processes were quickly born. Former Cinerama business partner, Mike Todd, once on his own, and apparently before the era of non-competes, created his own widescreen process known as Todd AO, and major motion pictures like Around the World in 80 Days in Oklahoma were made popular sensations in it. And Carl Dudley, the director of one of the subsequent 1950s Cinerama features, also created his own lens called Vistarama, uh, and that it was uh, it and Tadeo were both single lens, single strip of film systems, and they were in the main. And there were dozens of others that sprung up around the world visions like Duo Vision, Super Panavision, Ultra Panavision, Arnold Vision, and scopes like Super Scope, Toho Scope, and the list goes on and on. There were even two three panel processes that were direct competitors, Cinemiracle and Kino Panorama. Cinerama had always hoped for a Hollywood partnership. As far back as the late 1940s, Cinerama inventor Fred Waller had invited studio reps out to his Huntington Long Island studio workshop to view test footage, but there was no partnering up. Oh, the reps were all impressed, you bet, but left saying it would be too expensive and too complicated for their mainstream theater distribution. Cinerama went so far as to hire the now let go by MGM Louis B. Mayer to be on its board of directors, hoping that he'd curry studio interest. But he died without getting Hollywood to partner up. By the late 1950s, after all this widescreen competition, one studio did become more interested. By 1959, MGM was raking in the profits from their Ben Hur and wanted desperately to stay on top. So why not? So with the confidence born of Ben Hur, they signed a historic co-production agreement with Cinerama. The MGM agreement called for the making of as many as six motion pictures, with at least two in the three-panel process. MGM was to have script approval and their choice of top-notch Hollywood directors and talent, and MGM would have the right to exploit the pictures after the Cinerama Roadshows runs were over, which started earlier in those markets where there were no Cinerama theaters. With regards to this latter point, the Cinerama president started an immediate worldwide Cinerama building boom in anticipation of these new pictures. The first two pictures got off to a well-publicized start and were Henry Levin and George Powell's whimsical adventure, The Wonderful World of the Brothers Grimm, and the rollicking outdoor all-star western, How the West Was Won, directed by a veteran trio of Henry Hathaway, George Marshall, and John Ford. 
and in them, Cinerama reached its zenith. In over 200 theaters around the world, more people saw this three-panel process than ever before. The Wonderful World of Brothers Grimm was last seen theatrically in three strip at the Cinerama Dome in Hollywood in 2012, projected from the very last surviving Technicolor color print. It was then determined that the print's litany of garnered battle scars, missing sprocket holes, tears, and repairs meant that it could never be shown again. Now let's hear from the man who spearheaded the digital restoration of this motion picture, my production partner, Dave Strom. Okay. Thanks, Randy. Uh, I'm going to give you a little preview of the documentary that's going to follow, and hope that it, most of you can stay, because this will teach you how to restore a Cinerama feature <laughs> on, your own, on your own Apple computer. So, as you can see, we're inspecting the negative here, and uh, the original 1994 uh, uh, reports said severe damage and a lot of water damage as well. This is a shot from the 35 millimeter cinemascope version that went out to your neighborhood theaters after the Cinerama run. So you can see it's kind of brown and the divide lines show up. To the bottom is what we've been able to do from the original negative. So it's a different negative than the one that's above. So you can see we, we gained a lot of sharpness and a lot of better color. I was invited over to Warner Brothers Motion Picture Imaging to uh, take a look at some of this damage, which I knew about, because I had a copy of all the reports. There was mold, holes in the film, uh, severe warpage, which, you know, it's like the film goes through, it's like snakes, it's wobbling, you know. I also stayed there and watched for a couple of days the uh, scanning process. And again, this is six perforations, not four, so everything had to be engineered for the six pers. And we, know, we were able to get some of the color in that. After all these files were turned over to me, we had to break everything down into each individual cut. And what we had to do with each one of them, such as dusting, flicker, blotcher, stabilize, vignetting, and, uh, and eventually the final color. And then the process of aligning everything came next to try to make the divide lines as invisible as possible, most of which we were able to do. Here's an example of some water damage that Tom Marks fixed up for us. And he used the frame interpolation process, which takes the damaged frame and takes a good frame on the, uh, on the A side of the damage and on the B side of the damage and, put, and morphs them together to equal one new frame. And then you can see the bottom. <laughs> then there's a density fluctuation, which is coming up next, where uh, another thing with film aging, and you can see it's each, with three panels, it's, it's doing it differently on each panel. So, how do you fix that? It's a, there's a, a process called uh, uh, that removes flicker, and you have to remove the flicker on each one of those panels and make the rhythm be exactly the same as the panel next to it. That gets to be a nice uh, week-long job, too. So anyway, I hope you can stay after the feature for the documentary uh, Rescuing a Fantasy Classic with Harrison Engel, who was the documentary filmmaker for many years. I've known him for over 20 years. He also did the documentary on uh, the restoration of Vertigo called Obsessed with Vertigo, if you've, uh, if you've seen that on, on the re home video release. So, uh, Randy? Thank you, Dave. From the start, it was decided to mount Cinerama's exhibition as a motion picture roadshow experience, hearkening back to Hollywood's tried and true upper shelf presentation of milestone motion picture events like Showboat and Gone with the Wind had received. Consequently, for the first picture and the first four Cinerama pictures that followed it, established musical composers were hired and full orchestras were recruited and the recording of full scores, each with a lavish overture, intermission and exit music were completed. And these will be a feature of the wonderful world of the Brothers Grimm. The presentation style, in essence, the theater's showmanship was also carefully crafted, thought out to match the spectacle and marked up ticket price. Reserve seats by, uh, and the theater manager greeting you at the door wearing a tuxedo were de rigueur. The entire width of the widest movie screen you'd likely ever seen was draped in curtains, which opened on cue partially at the end of the overture and then dramatically completely at the picture's start, a show in itself. And you'll see a bit of that today, too. 
Regarding that screen, I have two volunteers in the audience today to help me illustrate just how curved a Cinerama screen would be. Okay, first of all, to my left, we have Harrison Engel, documentarian, uh, like myself from Los Angeles. And over here to my right, we have Tom March, uh, who worked on the image restoration on the dock on the front of the building. a retired Canadian Broadcasting Corporation engineer and also has a center around a screen in his home. So be on for that. Now, if this were a center around the theater, and imagine me being the center of the screen, the screen would start where Harrison is, gently curve around to me, and curve back around to Tom. So you can see how those of you in the first two or three or four rows in this theater would be completely surrounded by the image. You'd be enveloped by it. It would consume you. It would be filling your peripheral vision. Okay? Thank you, Harrison and Tom. <laughs> Brothers Grimm premiered simultaneously in Los Angeles and New York on the same day, August 7th, 1962 here at the Old Capitol, then hastily renamed the Lowe's Cinerama at 1639 Broadway and 51st. Their screen was on a whopping 90 foot wide by 35 foot tall uh, dimension. Did any of you see it there? Shout out. Good, I see a hand in the dark, couple of hands. Good. Good, good. I hope you relive the magic. To all of you, it's not where you sit, it's where you look. So carefully, mindfully, look into that center panel from time to time and allow those side panels to fill your peripheral vision. Our show is smile box, so you'll be looking at a simulated curved screen image right here on this very flat screen behind me. Lastly, we lost one of our two leading ladies last week, so I ask you to please take an extra moment to appreciate the considerable contribution of actress Yvette Mimieu to the picture. She's never looked lovelier than she will here. Now enjoy the road show, and projectionists, hit that curtain. <laughs> Thank you.